And we will now start the first part of today's conference. And uh, in the focus will be cross-border journalism. And the first person speaking about this will be Mr. Evelyne Kalabuik. He is the UNNET CEO. Hello there. And he will probably look for an answer to the question whether there is a solution to enhance the quality of EU journalism. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, Isabel Durand, for this uh, insightful uh, introduction. And I will try to echo that by some questioning at the same time. It's true that uh, when we talk about uh, European journalism, we just uh, have the impression that there is a, a monolithic block and that European journalism is one. We can see, in fact, that there is a very uh, wide diversity of journalism. We should even talk about journalisms in Europe in some way, because, of course, we can distinguish several different kinds of, of schools of thought and different cultures of journalism. We have here a very renowned journalist around the table, and probably they will catch this ball and try to elaborate on that. But we could, of course, talk about Anglo-American journalism or about Mediterranean journalism or about continental journalism. It's true that it's deeply rooted also on the cultures and on the national cultures and on the political cultures. So if we take it by that angle, we could say that, in fact, there are as many journalism as there are countries in Europe. At the same time, we can also say that there are really common groundings, best practices, industrial constraints, which lead with some kind of globalization of journalism. And this is also partly another trend which is quite interesting, which is to see what is really more uh, in common and shared in, as common values between journalists and what is really specific to journalists. And, and of course, one of the core issues is in this ingrained in this very huge diversity, how and what is specific to covering EU affairs. It's true that within the media themselves, there's a tendency of thinking that this is boring, basically. It's, uh, of course, quite uh, difficult to interest in the uh, news gathering, in the agenda setting, it's quite uh, difficult to interest about European issues, except, of course, when there is a major crisis which becomes international. But in, in this very particular case, all the journalists around the table have experienced the difficulty in selling subjects to their own uh, news desk at home in order to be interesting and in order to really cover not only the crisis as a major event, but also the daily construction of European events. So this is probably also a question that we may raise, is why is it so? Is it something very specific about covering EU affairs, which is uh, an unknown object as compared to international news or whatever? And I think this is also a clue that we should try to elaborate on. Coming back to, to Euronet itself, uh, of course, and this is not a, a magic recipe, we try to address some of the points which were uh, addressed by Isabelle Durand. We try to do what we label uh, cross-border journalism. We try to go beyond borders. We try to see uh, not only uh, built on the national forces of each of the uh, individual journalistic uh, uh, cultures and radios, how we can cope with the subject on the different angles from the different countries in Europe. And that brings a lot of interest to the, to the listeners. We have, of course, several flagship programs in several languages, Treffunk Europa, Network Europe, Accent Europe, which really try to look at the same uh, event through uh, multiple ways and multiple angles. And we see that there is uh, quite a success in that. But of course, this is not enough. And we probably have to think, uh, you were mentioning the story of training, which is also a very important point. We see that there is a, a decreasing number of journalists in Brussels accredited, and that uh, I would say the seniority of the journalist is also decreasing, which also is a, is a question to address. Uh, basically, we will see also in the second part of the workshops that there are many basic fundamentals which have to be there in order to interest uh, the public at large, of course, editorial independence, human interest. Uh, watchdog journalism is also an important point. It's true that many times, uh, because we rely on sources which are quite standardized, it's difficult to bring something which is new a story which is interesting, an angle which is interesting, which really concerns the people on a daily basis. We try modestly to do that uh, with some success over the past years, but of course a lot of work has to be done in that, in that way. And basically I would say that what we are aiming at is not standardizing European journalism. I think that we have to both build on very strong existing cultures which are there, but at the same time try on top of that to see what are the best practices that we can use and how we can find a European common grounding to cover in a better way news, to see in which way we can in some way fill this missing link which exists between the daily you know, uh, affairs of uh, European institutions and the uh, endless 
uh, and numerous uh, coverage of, of, of things which are quite important by themselves but who do not come cross over to the, to the public. So basically I will really uh, conclude this uh, very short uh, introductory uh, throwing of the ball by advocating for a very uh, balanced European journalism, of course grounded on the multiple voices, but trying of course to find some kind of uh, overall symphony which respects all the individual cultures of journalism. Thank you very much, Ellen's from Euronet. Um, I'd just like to, before we go on to our third speaker, perhaps just now turn to some of our, is the mic on? I think it is. I'll go to the middle because we've got crazy acoustics in this room. There we go. Um, to turn to some of our students, and I would really urge you not to be shy. Sorry, there's a bit of an echo here. Um, and where are the students? Can you raise your hands where you all are, the journalism students? There you go. So if you don't volunteer to speak, I'm going to have to pick out somebody at random. But we've just had some comments here, thoughts about where journalism is going, particularly about the difficulty of covering, for instance, European affairs. Is that something that you want to do or you think is the biggest turn-off ever? And do any of you actually hope for a career in covering EU affairs or not? Or do you have any other thoughts? Hands up. There we go. Thank you very much for being very brave. And can you tell us who you are and uh, where you're studying? Hello, my name is Luis Alvarez, and I'm studying at the University of Salamanca and collaborating with Radio Usar, which is our radio station. And I would like to raise the question of not only that, what, what lies behind this crisis of European journalists, which in my view, it may be a lack of awareness about the European Union. I think in times of crisis, like uh, the times we're living right now, each country, not only the European Union countries, but all, every country, and even individuals and themselves, tend to turn to themselves. Like, um, times are going in a bad way, then I have to look for myself first. And this happens at every level. So what I think it's happening in, in – I, I see it in Spain pretty much, but I guess it's pretty much the same in every country. It's like there's a lack of interest in what's happening beyond, a lack of interest in – things that may not touch us directly, but may help us. And this is like a cycle which is always uh, spinning and has no, um, has no way out, because if there's no interest in what's happening outside our country, then the need of um, a, Europe, a transcultural, transbordering journalism seems to be redundant. So the question I would like to raise here is how this can be tackled. I think, for instance, that um, students' programs such as Erasmus or everything that uh, helps bring in the European cultures together are a very good help, but it seems it's not enough because still in Spain, again, I, I bring my sample, um, most of people do not know what's happening, especially in countries that have recently come to the European Union, such as Hungary or Estonia. Many Spanish people don't even know where those countries are. So I think what's what needs to be done, first of all, is raising some awareness about the importance of the European Union institutions, and that may help and also act for, for a positive feedback for European journalism. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I'd like to come back to some of those points later on. It's Luis, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Um, that's a very nice, tidy link to our third speaker, Karel Bartak. You're from the European Commission. And uh, I just want to ask you then the question, what can be done to raise awareness about European issues and also about EU institutions, how they work? And is that the job of the European Commission? Should we actively be trying to promote a kind of cross-border journalism and perhaps give the mission to our reporters to be reporting on the EU, however difficult, dry, whatever else that might be? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh... I think, well, some answers uh, or some uh, topics have already been uh, tackled, and I think that in the introduction, most of, uh, most of the big question marks uh, uh, were, uh, were expressed, uh, which we are facing today. But uh, to come to start uh, with, the, with answering the, the, the question, well, uh, we have always had this situation in Europe uh, that journalists were above all interested in their home countries and uh, above all writing about their domestic affairs. Uh, but the, given the crisis which we are going through today, and it's the economic crisis of the sector, of course, uh, when we can speak uh, later about the reasons why 
the media are worse off than they were a few years ago. But uh, we also have new challenges which have come up, which have led to the situation which seems to be uh, less interest in the European Union than in the past. If you just measure it by the number of correspondents in Brussels, and I used to be one of them uh, s some years ago, uh, then you can say, okay, the um, the editors are not interested in Europe anymore. They are calling back their staff. It is not as clear as that, as simple as that, because uh, you, the electronic revolution has uh, come uh, through in the meantime, and we must see today that many media are simply not interested in paying a correspondent in the situation where you have access to more or less everything in the world online at the same time, and the advantage of being physically on the spot is not always very obvious for all media. So uh, you can just imagine a situation which uh, I have been through uh, personally several times, that you are sitting in uh, the uh, antichamber of, uh, of an MEP waiting for an interview, and in the meantime the person is tweeting around, uh, sending messages, and having uh, several of your colleagues from your home country on the, on the mobile phone. So when you come in with the huge advantage of being in Strasbourg, you are, you are the last to get the information. So uh, this is also something we, you know, we have to create, I think, in the European institutions, a feeling that being in Brussels is an advantage. We have to give something more than we usually do, because <clears throat> at the same time we have always been saying, okay, this is the crème de la crème, these people in Brussels, but we must above all take care about those who do not have the means to come. We must try to send the messages to them. Those who are in Brussels, they will get them somehow anyway. It is, does not work very well that way. Now I come to what we are doing uh, as, as uh, uh, the institutions. Perhaps also the fact that the journalists are not there or that there's just 20% coverage uh, is that uh, pe pe simply the media do not feel the relevance of uh, the European institutions, of the European, of the European project as such. On one hand, of course, uh, we are very important because we are tackling the crisis, but at the same time, many people have the feeling that the decisions are perhaps taken in Bonn or in Berlin or in, in Paris and not in Brussels. So again, uh, we have to see the political context and the historical context of, uh, of uh, this, this crisis, not only thinking that you know, uh, people are not, not interested because Europe has become more more dull than it was before. Uh, we are as dull as we were uh, in the past, and I think that uh, we have uh, to find means how to make ourselves more attractive without uh, falling into the trap of uh, selling ourselves to the media. Uh, basically, what the journalists would like to have today? They would like to have a tailor-made information for each country so that the, the, the information which you provide is, has a national angle where possible and that the journalist can get the interest for himself from this message. If you pass pan-European messages, which are very well done, very well written, there is going to be no interest whatsoever on the side of the journalists who are always working for their home media. The situation is like that. We are talking about European public space. It is wonderful, but that's not the way the editors are thinking back at home who have to sell the paper and who have to have a good audimat, uh, uh, I mean, performance. So uh, we have to adapt to that, and I must say critically that in the European Commission at least we do not have the means to do this. I am not able, when I prepare my uh, press releases uh, several times a week, to have 27 uh, I mean, uh, alternatives of these press releases with, with 27 different examples from 27 member states. That would be the ideal situation. So we are trying, of course, to find ways how to do this, to make the journalists interested, to give them links and so on, so that they can find the national angle. But at the same time, as I said, we must not try to become journalists ourselves. And that is some, some, sometimes the, the tendency that the institutions have to, to try to be so attractive, to start press releases with questions, you know, to, to, to start being funny and so on. I don't think that we should be funny. We should be transparent. 
we should be uh, we should be uh, we should be showing why this is important what we are doing we should be interesting but we should say okay this is the european institution this is what we are telling you it is a complex thing we must not be you know oversimplifying it's up to the journalists then to simplify but if we already start making things simple then they continue then the outcome is that the citizen simply doesn't learn about the reality so let us uh, think about these things uh, as well from, from this point of view. Uh, for last remark, uh, I would like to say I think that the European Commission is doing something uh, in, in, the, in, the good, uh, in the good direction. Uh, that is, for instance, uh, supporting uh, uh, the Euronews uh, TV channel, which I think has grown in, in quality and um, which is uh, rather <coughs> uh, well, which is which is very well, uh, which is very well, which has very good results as far as the Odimat is concerned. Uh, Uranet is a good example of a bit of support because I think that this initiative is fantastic and linking uh, radios together all over Europe and putting uh, uh, news items and reports into a common basket uh, for, to be used by, by the others is a wonderful idea and uh, it seems that it works and I hope that it's going to work better and better uh, in, in the future. European Journalism Centre with Willy, who is there, I think has been, has been uh, uh, training journalists now for decades and uh, has been doing a very good job. But um, I think a lot more needs to be done. We need to have journalists in the member states who know the context. That is, I think, the most important, that somebody writing about uh, a law being passed in the national parliament must know that there was a directive ex adopted two years ago, and this is just a transposition of the directive, should know what, what, what was the, the background here back in the European Union. This is what very, very seldom happens, and we should be trying hard to make journalists aware of the European context. I think this is, and the new generation of journalists above above all. That is why I think we should be thinking about more exchanges, about um, Erasmus for journalists. We should be thinking about more traineeships. Well, well several schemes can, can be discussed, but I think that this is one of the, one of the directions uh, we should be taking. I won't be taking more of your time at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kale, Karel Bartak, uh, for raising some good points again. And we will now move to uh, Anna Maria Darmanin from uh, the European Economic and Social Committee. Hello there. She is the Vice President for Communication. And again, she will be moving from a model from uh, Mr. Bartak to AIMS and maybe looking for an answer to a question whether cross-border journalism is a reachable aim. Right. I, I also would like to react to some things which I've already heard, if you don't mind, because um, we have been given a very clear picture of what the situation is um, uh, from, from the Vice President. Uh, but this is where I don't agree with the Commission, where uh, we don't necessarily have to be boring or remain being boring. Um, it, 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 we don't have to be appealing and being funny, but we have to be interesting. And yes, we have to have a good policy to communicate because really the principles remain the same. And good policy can exist without good communication, but good communication cannot exist without good policy. So maybe we should be getting less excited about the tools and more thinking about the content um, that we have. And also there's, there's the aspect that as institutions what we should work up upon is um, giving faces. Usually you need a face behind an idea. And I often ask myself, who is the face of the EU? Is there a face to the can EU? Can we just stop there? Can we just ask that? That's a fantastic point. Can we just ask that to the students? Face of the EU, shout out some names who you think is the face of the EU and do we need somebody more charismatic, do you think? Would it help if we had somebody with lots of kind of personal flair or, yeah, Herman von Rompuy? Do you think people know who Herman von Rompuy is? They do? Yeah, so can we have that answer there? <laughs> I was just being polemic and say that Mercosi is the face exactly. of the EU. Exactly. Well, there we have it. <laughs> 
Okay, Thank you very so much. are you saying are you saying we just need more of a figurehead as well, or we need just more? W w yeah, is it is it some is it the fact that we just need better, bigger personalities to talk about Europe in a more engaging way? And are we short of that? And if so, this has been a really long-standing pro pr problem. Why has this not happened? We had a perfect opportunity a couple of years ago when we appointed Hamon von Rompuy and Catherine Ashton. Arguably, neither of them have made big waves and certainly not made the story any more interesting or sexier for journalists. Absolutely. We have different faces. We don't have that much of a charismatic um, face. Um, it is, we all know who these faces are, but also think about it in perspective with other continents. I mean, you have the Obama who is everybody knows who's Obama. You speak of the EU, you just don't know. And we do need that because also the man in the street um, does not make a distinction between what is the parliament, the council, um, uh, the commission, I dare say my own institution, one of the smaller institutions, which many don't know about it. It's always Brussels. And therefore the journalist needs to also speak about Brussels, but this is also mixed messages coming, coming up, and this is also the onus on us as institutions to be more coordinated amongst ourselves in ensuring that we have a message, a good message to communicate. And then, really the journalists, yes, we need the journalists to be um, having a better idea, having a better knowledge, and this is where I agree with the Commission that we have the possibilities in our hands of increasing Erasmus for journalists, for example, of having training programs for journalists, of using best practices amongst the institutions and sharing these best practices. But also we hear about Euronews. Um, I don't know how many watch Euronews. I watch Euronews. But maybe we should think about its greater availability, um, greater interest, and a wider perspective towards the journalism it's doing, and also the language range it has, because it's a great project in terms of the idea, but it seems to have stopped somewhere. And we need to push it further, because it can be a very interesting means of news for, for the man in the street. Everybody has access to Euronews. I say for my country, we still tend to see BBC World. And sometimes, unfortunately, some people even CNN. So these are the aspects we should be thinking of. I mean, there, a lot of responsibility does lie on the journalists now. It, it, we need to be also speaking about policy and not just politics, not just something which, which um, is fun, um, not just something which is scandalous, because very often the journalist is interested in the scandal and not the policy. So we really need our journalists to be doing real investigative um, journalism and be curious of how something is, is affecting um, their member state. But a lot lies as well on the owner of the media. The owner and the editor, and you mentioned the editor, but yes, the owner, and I think the British case, the British newspaper and the Murdoch case shows us clear enough where interests lay. And it is very much a owner, um, most often, who dictates what goes into the, the newspaper. So before pointing fingers also at the journalists, we should look at the owners and who owns the, the, the media. And in this respect, also in terms of ultimately um, uh, the journalists, we do need to feed in the good information, the good policy. And yes, we do need to make it interesting for the journalists. And this is where I think we will achieve the cross-border uh, aspect and really get the aims we want to achieve by having um, this more EU in the local media. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Ana Maria. We will be coming back to you, um, the students, in just a second. Uh, we, just very briefly, you did talk about Euro News, but on the other side, the flip side of that is we've got BBC World who are going to be scrapping their EU current affairs programme. CNN don't even have a reporter here, good or bad. You know, it's a massive, it's a, it's a massive network. Sky doesn't have anybody here in Brussels. So it's unfortunately not all good. But um, to perhaps react to that, I've got Marek Siviek. Uh, uh, who's an MEP here from the uh, Socialist Group and a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. If you could give us some of your thoughts to what's just been said. Thank you very much. Well, oh, I'm, I'm sorry you're here. No, I'm sorry. I was pointed to that. I can't, I've got very bad eyesight. Maybe, I'm so sorry. Some, some, you're here. Apologies. Somebody very, <laughs> very similar like me sitting on the other side. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, um, honestly speaking, uh, 
having some uh, journalist background, uh, it's not very easy to, uh, to be plugged into this discussion because uh, we know how these things look like. Uh, but I would like to share with you some uh, uh, reflections uh, without any ambitions to, to solve the problem or to give a final answer, but at least to, uh, to uh, say how it looks, uh, how the situation uh, of the media and journalists looks from, from our point of view. Uh, the, first, the first thing is that uh, the title of this discussion is uh, EU and Journalism in Crisis. Uh, I think the, the problem is not uh, uh, in the, the crisis uh, among the, the journalists or, uh, or in the United States. The problem is the crisis among the audience, because the audience creates demand. Uh, as long as there is a certain demand uh, for a certain uh, behavior of the journalists, plus publishers, plus owners, whatever, because this is the same basket. I think we, uh, we, we cannot focus on, uh, on the journalism because they are only transmission uh, uh, part of, uh, of this business. They provide this what people want to buy. Uh, as long as the, 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 the demand is for simple, uh, bloody, and uh, uh, attractive things, this must be supplied. And this is the, the, the answer why the situation exists like it exists. And of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, if somebody starts to complain about the journalist, I stop this person saying, come on, don't complain, because he's doing his job. He must provide the, 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 the product which, which will be sold. OK, uh, you can complain about the, uh, the audience. This, these audience are your voters. Remember, as long as you complain about your voters, it means there's something wrong with you, not with them. That's, this, is, this, this is the first thing. The second thing is that uh, we, as a politician, we, we do not feel comfortable in this situation because uh, we are dreaming about, uh, we are naive, first of all, of, uh, first of all, naive that we are dreaming about the media which reflect all the positive things, uh, saying some good words about us from time to time, uh, not uh, blaming us that we are uh, nasty, uh, lazy, uh, whatever, whatever. Sometimes we apply to, to, to have some uh, uh, good news from our, our field. Uh, this is very difficult to, uh, to, to get. So what we are doing? We have created, uh, that's point number two, the alternative circulation of the information. That's what the Internet is now. I have never, uh, okay, I, could, I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't see it before because there was not such a presence of the internet in the past. But believe me, uh, uh, having a certain coverage of the websites of a, of, a num of, a, of a number member of parliaments who are really taking care of this, what they are doing, you can get alternative uh, source of information. And uh, it works. It works and I believe that uh, if there is any chance to build a competition uh, in this world. The Internet is the only place because we are very close to cooperate uh, as, the, as the people who, who provide the news to our website. If we start to cooperate one day, we are very close to build a, uh, the, the, the framework, the, the network of, uh, of the independent uh, information. So this is a chance that uh, uh, one day uh, we can also read the good things about us. Uh, okay, a little bit provocative. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the last thing, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which I think is especially important for the young people who are sitting uh, uh, around the, this, uh, the, the, this hall, I don't know why in the second and the third row, uh, I, I welcome all of you. Uh, I think that uh, there is a big demand for uh, big names in the journalism. Uh, uh, these names disappeared, or there are very, very few of them. But the quality, which is very difficult, uh, in confrontations with, with the, the, the quantity, uh, in the long term range, uh, using also internet, it can be a successful story. So the problem is that the, the people like you or your colleagues, I believe not you, they do not work uh, hard to build a quality in their job. So uh, if I uh, uh, would say what is the most popular 
way uh, of the journalism uh, form uh, speaking about the European Union. This is interview with European politics because it's easy to ask the questions even if you have no idea what these guys are speaking about. Because you can ask, what do you think of this? And how, how, why this is not like you? So, so, so interview only uh, looks uh, as a simple, it's not simple, but many people think that this is, uh, this is uh, the, the, the way how we can speak about the European Union. I cannot mention in the Polish media more than two or three uh, journalists who can speak, relate, and refer to the issues of the European Union. So uh, this is my conclusion. I would like to wish the, the young uh, ladies and gentlemen sitting here uh, to, uh, 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 to fulfill this vacancy uh, in the future. But really for that, uh, you don't have to only to know how to carry the microphone. Sometimes you have to, uh, to, to know uh, what is the behind the nice answer. We are very skilled in the nice answers. Uh, uh, by the way, the members of parliament, are, uh, we are uh, designed to speak, uh, not, not to listen. Uh, Mr. Siewiec, but, Mr. Marek, uh, for, for, sorry? I'm sorry you will have to conclude because we're very behind schedule. Uh, how so did sorry, you find that I'm, I'm approaching the conclusion? It was not interesting that you... you it's fascinating. <laughs> fascinating, <laughs> okay. Fascinating with this recommendation say, I can... Yeah. So uh, it was my last point that uh, think about the quality. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I've said, I've said, as I've said earlier, we're very behind schedules and uh, Mrs. Evelyn Gebhardt will have to leave very soon. So I would like to ask you to uh, shortly react to what's been said so far. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here today and I have to leave in three minutes because I have to go to a vote in my committee. Uh, so I will not be a very long. Uh, but I think it is uh, really very important to see that we do have a uh, very different uh, level of uh, journalism we have to take care of. We do have the medias which are on the national level or international level on the one hand, but we have also m uh, many medias uh, which are very important for us in our constituencies, the so little-sized medias. Uh, and uh, there uh, we do have sometimes many diff uh, problems how to manage to reach both sides. And uh, as uh, um, uh, it was said, we have to take care that the demand is another on the national level or in the level on the, in the, uh, on the, the regional level. level. And uh, uh, that is really not easy for us uh, to, to, to take care of, uh, on that because uh, uh, European policies are made for European citizens, 500 million of one. In the same time, the uh, 200,000 in the region want to know what is the particular point which is done for them. Not for the whole, but for them. And that is uh, uh, an approach we didn't learn to, to, to go with. Uh, and I think that is one point we have to discuss also about and uh, uh, to, to take care on that. I did have last week Commissioner um, uh, Barnier in my constituency. I was really very happy about that. And I did invite journalists, it's clear. And uh, the local journalists did say, no, I will not be there because uh, what, what, is, uh, what is the regional point? So I have to say, okay, Michel Barnier is, uh, uh, is, is not uh, German, is not uh, from my uh, uh, point. He didn't come. He didn't come. And, uh, so, and, and such are reactions uh, where I am asking what have I to do to reach this one journalist, uh, saying him, uh, as, um, laws we are making, and uh, he's saying it is for Europe, it's not for me. Uh, sorry, but Europe, it, he is in Europe. It is, uh, Europe is not somewhat else. And so um, I think uh, we have to, to make really a very uh, big work on uh, showing which are the politics we are doing in, on European level on the one side, but on the other side to, to, to give um, a tool to, to journalists, to young journalists, to, to, comp to have a comprehension what is European policy and how to show, and we have to bring also one, another point 
to show uh, what, uh, what are the, the links between European policy, national policy, and regional policy. And there, I think we have to work more and more about that, because if we can give that comprehension, that at the end, uh, we, it will uh, be an understanding about politics in Europe. If we cannot do that, then we will lose at the end. So I'm sorry I have to leave. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Evelyn Gibhard. Can I just ask um, some of our young journalists here, how difficult do you think it is to make, to report on the EU, and what would be helpful to make it more comprehensible? Does the internet help? Does Twitter help? Um, what, what, would be, what would be useful, do you think? What would, be, what would help you, do you think? Any ideas? Thank you. Just introduce yourself for us. Um, I'm Kirsi from Finland um, and uh, Radio Moreni. Um, you mentioned that the quality and you said that the journalists don't work enough, hard enough to make sure that the journalists quality is good. I would rather say that um, bad quality is because journalists are always so hurry. Uh, you have five minutes time to do your work if you work in a radio station or social media where the news has to come out very quickly. So it's impossible to do good work in five minutes. You can't do any extra research or check the details. And that's why we always do the mistakes. And then your boss is complaining to you that didn't you check that, even though we have one minute time to do it. And then we get stressed and then we get, you know, <laughs> bad journalism. So maybe mass media is one reason that we always so hurry, but maybe mm, we need more time. <laughs> but have you reported on the EU and have you found it um, how difficult have you found it to make the link to your audience about what's going on here in Brussels? Nobody knows. If I go to Finland and I ask the students that you know what they're talking about in Brussels, they say, well, if I need to know something, I check that in the Internet. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, not, it's not that easy, is it? Okay, well, let's, let's turn now to a veteran EU correspondent who might have some thoughts. Quentin. Uh, Quentin Dickinson, who's a journalist with uh, Radio France International, and you've been here for a while. How has reporting from the EU changed? Has it become more difficult? Um, has, are there more opportunities? Or, and, and what do you think generally about the mood among journalists in terms of reporting on the story here in Brussels? Quite honestly, Madam Chairman, I don't believe the mood has changed that much. I think we're still confronted with the same problems which we had here 25 years ago. Simply, as our young colleague from Finland pointed out just now, uh, probably rhythm has accelerated and stress has gone together with it. I don't believe this is inevitable. I think that uh, the press corps here, which is roughly 900 journalists strong, and is stabilizing around this uh, figure. I, I believe that uh, there should be less bombardment by the various institutions and probably uh, more thought put into what a decision reached by the Council or by the Commission or by the Parliament for that matter, what this actually means in immediate terms of importance in the everyday lives of our listeners and our readers. I think this is the bottom line, basically. Before this um, seminar started, you asked me whether I thought that uh, um, audiences here were catered for exclusively in terms of uh, national media, turning their back, as it were, to some sort of extraordinary supranational truth? Well, I don't actually know what you expected me to answer, but my feeling is that this is not bad nor sinful, and that it probably is natural and obvious. After all, we don't operate in a vacuum. There's no such thing as ghost audiences. And uh, if you look at the um, inevitable media crisis we're going through now, obviously private sector media, a majority, have to be very careful not to 
be ahead or behind their target audiences. There are tremendous financial constraints for the private sector media. These financial constraints are symptoms. They're probably not the primary cause for the media crisis. If we look at public service broadcasting, there again, um, we're not talking about operating in a vacuum. Public service broadcasters have to bear in mind that the taxpayer pays for them and doesn't expect to have programs or articles which cater for a minority audience or for a highly specialized audience. Therefore, I, I see no ill in bearing in mind that we're operating for specific audiences, and these are national. There is, of course, you might object, the special case of international, of world broadcasters, such as Radio France International, the BBC World Service, or the Deutsche Welle to mention, but three major caterers in this area. One must also be able to see that these very worthy institutions are operating for a very select elite around the world, elite in business, elite in politics, elite in places of learning. These radios and televisions will never, never serve the masses, never. You must be clear about this in your minds. Therefore, the message that the European institutions are attempting to put across and have been attempting to put across for the better part of the past 40 years will not transit in an effective way through these media. My feeling is that concrete Europe, as it's sometimes awkwardly described, exists probably not through accounts given in detail of lengthy ministerial meetings or wide-ranging out-of-reach policies. Very much more, on the other hand, through limited but concrete decisions made here or in Luxembourg by the EIB, which bring about a real change or real improvement in the daily lives of people in the regions or in cities. In other words, the burden lies with the local and regional media, as Mrs. Gebhardt just indicated, and these, alas, are also the least represented here in Brussels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dickinson. We will now have a short introduction from the next uh, journalist. This will be Mr. Andrzej Szczeniewski from the Polish radio. He is the president of the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the most important elements of the mission of public radio is to inform the citizens in a reliable way about all the aspects of social, economical, political, and cultural life. The quality of radio programs produced by us should always be the highest and distinguish us positively from the offer of commercial broadcasters. Public radio should always be the leader on the market in terms of professionalism and deontological ethical standards. The mission that the public radio fulfills is not equal to the role of a commercial one and any comparison between these two should always take uh, this into consideration. The current situation of the journalistic profession is, from our po point of view, extremely important. Unfortunately, the title of our roundtable, European Journalism in Crisis, that describes a dangerous trend, is valid also for Poland. For some period of time, we observe also in Poland the deterioration of the standards and of quality of journalistic work. There are many different factors that influence the current situation, but there are three main trends that are dangerous for public media. In the future, they could be even stronger. First of them is the commercialization of the content. We observe that the media are overloaded with commercials, but we also see that some journalists mix the commercial advertisement with news and comments, 
which is a direct threat to the credibility and independence of the media. Second is the attempt of politicization of the media. It is not only a danger of making from media a tribune for any given political party, but also of creating a program too much concerned with politics, which distorts the view and gives the audience false impression about the importance of some facts and events. In the result, it makes the program unreal and draws away the public. Third of them all is the financial crisis that for many reasons touches also the media, both public and private. In Poland, we observe the constant decrease of the income from the license fee, which makes difficulties in maintaining the necessary level and variety of offer. It also distorts the planning and the de development, first of all, in the technical sphere. Despite all of the harmful factors mentioned above, many public broadcasters still keep the highest editorial standards and variety offer. This is the case of Polish radio, I hope. We are still one of the leaders of the market having about 20% of the total audience. We are conscious of the responsibilities that we have for the citizens of Poland and of the whole European Union. Despite of uh, the problems mentioned above, we managed to maintain both independence and professional standards. Moreover, we are still analyzing the needs of the population and we react according to them. The recent structural changes that we made aimed at better adjusting to the needs of the listeners. They make the work and the production of specialized audio programs done by experts in the matter more efficient. I'm going to have to interrupt very briefly. I can give you just another two minutes. I'm so sorry. It's just we have so many other speakers who've just arrived. Apologies. Please carry on. Okay. Uh, this is uh, why we created, for example, the new foreign desk and uh, new sport desk in Polish Radio. Despite of financial difficulties, Polish Radio increases the production on international, European and global affairs, not only related to our part of the world. We are fulfilling thus also as a member of the Euronet network the obligation to inform the audience. We constantly work on the professional level of our journalists. We introduced new system of exams for journalists and we check their skills. We also take care for the highest standards of Polish language that our journalists use on air. As in many other areas, according to the social and economical changes, there appear negative and positive trends. Polish radio devotes much effort to combating the negative and uh, strengthening the positive ones. Unfortunately, as always in the case of public media, not everything depends only on the managers and journalists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Apologies for having to cut you short. I just wanted to say uh, a brief welcome again to some of you who have just arrived because I understand some of you are blocked downstairs. Apologies for that. Uh, we're going to just take a couple more comments and I'm going to ask our next speakers just to be as brief as possible. Um, and then I would really encourage the students afterwards just to uh, please actually turn this into a debate and also not just the students, all of you sitting over there as well. Um, Isabel Durand, I would just like to uh, perhaps, uh, Quentin just had to pop out, but he did mention that basically the EU will never reach, reporting on the EU will never reach mass audiences. It will always be a niche kind of elite uh, subject matter because some of the local media, local radio stations, etc., just do not come to Brussels to report on that. Can you just react on that particular point and anything else that you've heard? And please, if I could ask you just to be brief. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very briefly, I agree with, uh, with what said uh, Quentin, uh, but I think that it is the same for the national level. Because the global political national level also is in the same uh, difficulty. Uh, the, the, the regional or the local media don't like the big uh, national question and prefer more proximity and very, uh, so we say, it, simple, bloody and sexy uh, information. So it means that uh, it's not a question only 
of the European Union, even if it is more difficult for the European Union affairs of uh, uh, information because it's more, a little bit more complex. Uh, and second thing is that, uh, uh, that what's said by a young guy from Salamanca, he explained that which is the, 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 the people don't like to have thing outside uh, their proximity news from the local level, etc. That's true. But there is, uh, I, 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 I answer to you, which is the egg and which is the, the keep. Because sometimes if you give to the people what they want and only on proximity level, it means that uh, it, it, it became, it became the, the reality. So there is a balance, uh, a very difficult balance to find uh, between uh, global and local uh, and between, and I think, and I finish with that, that the, the, um, the story, tell a story is the better way to explain to the people. If you begin with, uh, and the European Parliament, it's always so, the people are speaking as experts with very technical words, etc. It's absolutely ununderstandable. But if you tell a story, a story of, uh, of, if, of, on, on one issue, uh, from the regional level to the European level, I think that it helps uh, to be uh, uh, understandable and to interest, because that's a question of the content, and we, we cannot be attractive and only to simplify, 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 at the end, nothing stay uh, from your message. So I think that we have to find a balance, and it's not so easy, but tell a story, uh, try to, yes, to, to, to be short and, and to go speed, because that's a question of the, the economic reality, but uh, even, so said Quentin, the public services, we, we will not have the possibility to speak with complexity to all the people, so we have to speak between of beyond the regional approach or the local approach, but with the link between the local and the global. Otherwise, you speak only about local things. It means that you forget all the European approach of the transnational uh, approach. So thank you, and I have to leave you also because I have to vote. <laughs> it's my, it's my thank job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to ask some of the students, uh, maybe you have some questions regarding national topics. How often do you, when you cover EU stories, still focus on national stories? Anyone? Everybody's turned very shy. Yeah. Come along. There's okay, a, one. thank you. Could yeah, you introduce yourself? Yeah, please? I'm Zina and I'm from Germany. I'm here for the Euro <laughs> debate Welcome. and um, I think it's kind of hard to focus on national news when you're working for like a local media because um, they won't even let you do it even if you introduce it and if you say hey this is interesting why can't we put it into the newspaper or into the radio program they will say wait well, you know there's no connection to the people here reading it because they always look at the aspects um, yeah, of closeness. They want to be really close. And of course, if you live in a village, it's more interesting for the people to know what your neighbor's daughter did last night than what's happening in the EU. So that's what they focus on. And I think they focus on this because they figured out that people are more interested into drama and they have to pay attention to what people actually want to read because um, if they earn their money through advertisement, they have to look at the coverage they have. So they have to stay by the things that people are interested in to, be, to have this higher coverage to be able to earn money. So I think there's a problem. And um, yeah, I think that's why it's kind of hard to put national news into local newspapers or radio programs. Thank you for raising up a very good point there. Maybe we have another uh, comment from another country perhaps, yes? Um, hello, my name is uh, David, I'm Spanish-German. And, um, well, the thing is, uh, we want, oh, oh yes, uh, I study here in Brussels at the Communication Institute, EX, um, and uh, I came to Brussels five months ago. The thing is, we cannot expect people all over Europe who spend nine or ten hours working to come home, then take care of the kids, and then get informed about European issues. I think that's too much asking of them. Um, if we want to make it more attractive to them, we cannot expect them to create more demand because nowadays it's the media that creates news. 
And I like radio. I've worked for radio for many, many years, and I'm glad to hear that in Poland um, you have opened a new sports desk. Uh, I worked for Deutsche Welle in Bonn. They have shut down the whole radio department so that the money that was destined to the radio goes to TV in Berlin, Deutsche Welle TV. I think that's the trend. That's the trend. Radio, for me, although I love radio, doesn't have much of a future because who consciously, consciously listens to radio? You listen to the radio when you're sitting in a car, you're listening to the radio when you're at home doing something, you consciously watch TV. I think we should focus more on TV. We can make Europe more attractive through TV. And if you're looking for a face, for someone to promote a face for the European Union, if there's one medium that cannot give you a face, it's radio. All right? I agree. Okay. <laughs> okay. If anyone else has a question, please save it for later. I would like to ask it because we are running a bit late. Some of the students uh, have just joined, so we have a large group here. And I will just pass the word to Vanessa, introducing the next speaker. And we have uh, a member of the European Parliament from can, Denmark. Can I just answer yes, our please friend, do. please, in Briefly, a few words? Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry about that, but I would dispute that radio has no future. I would, I would dispute that too. <laughs> And um, millions and millions of people every day listen, as you said, rightly, to sound broadcasting in their car. Radio is something which is in your life, it's in your mind, and it doesn't have to be looked at. Try and experience. Get up in the morning, set your stopwatch, listen to the radio, do everything you have to do in your bathroom, in your kitchen and stop the stopwatch when you leave your flat. And do the, th the same thing the next day with early morning television. You'll probably add half an hour onto your early morning habits. Television takes you entirely into its grip. Radio is something you can choose to listen to. And apart from these millions of people who every day travel to work and come home from work, and who can't watch television safely, at least in their car. Apart from these, a lot of people, and not only elderly people, find solace and comfort in listening to radio programs. You're thinking only of radio news. There's very much more to radio than just news. And I would also say that one of the great advantages of radio is you don't see the faces of the people you're listening to. <laughs> no offense meant. But it also means that if you take a selection, a panel of 50 people listening to the same radio program, not one of them will have the same physical representation of the person they're listening to through radio. This is the magic part of radio, which stimulates your imagination and your dreams, and that cannot be replaced. Thank you very much, Kantin. Thank you. And I would add from experience that reporting on the EU for radio is infinitely easier than uh, for television because the EU is television death. You cannot illustrate process and policy and debates for television that happen here. It's really, really difficult. I'm going to ask you just to hold your thought very briefly. Can you just hold your thought? Or, or, or just say it. Just say it. Come on. Come along. It's a very, very remarkable what's said about radio and there's something else about the importance of radio and it, that's reaching to the communities that have no access to TV. There are many. As part of an internship I had to do last semester with the UNO, we had to translate text on a radio pro project in Sudan in communities where access to a TV signal is unfortunately not possible. And for these communities, radio is, as uh, Monsieur has said, um, a big solace, but also um, and sometimes the only kind of source of information, which I think is still to be treasured somehow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Morten Messerschmidt, a member of, from Denmark. I can't see you, I'm afraid. Is it, is it, that's you, isn't it? Um, should it be the duty of the EU to get reporters interested in what happens here? Can that be achieved, or should we just give up this fight? Well, I think that's an important point. Uh, so far, most speakers have been concerned about whether the journalists or the consumers of the media were doing the right thing, had the right preferences, and so I think actually the arrow ought to point in a quite other direction, namely at the EU institution. I mean, this entire institution has been built in a very unconsumer-wise for journalists uh, way. 
I used to be a member of a real parliament, the Danish one, and, um, and therefore suffer from experience from such a parliament. And, and some of the, the stories that occurred through my activity there where, for instance, when I uh, threatened the minister and even had a majority in parliament in doing so, and the minister, if he or she didn't act, um, actually had uh, to leave uh, his or her position in the cabinet. See, that's a story that a journalist would like to, to, to write. Here, if all 751 members of this chamber uh, regarded as eminently important that a commissioner step down, he or she had no obligations to do so because we don't have this right. So why should any journalist ever write this insignificant story? Or just uh, take it on the, on the possibility of proposing, uh, c coming with new suggestions for legislative acts. If all MEPs in this building were agreeing on, on a new proposal, we couldn't act at all because the initiative is in monopolized at the, uh, at the uh, Commission. The entire process here uh, of legislation makes it utterly impossible to find out when a story is actually relevant. Is it when the Commission comes with its proposal, when the uh, European Parliament takes its stand the first or the second time? Is it when the compromise is reached? Is it when the member states implement or when the judge comes with a new surprising judgment? I mean, when is it actually that, 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 the, that, that the story is, is there? Um, in my country, uh, the times where EU is really on the agenda, on the population, on the media and so, is when we uh, have, when the population as such has a say in the matter. Uh, obviously, people are mostly interested, also with reference to the decentralizing uh, discussion that Sina mentioned, uh, most people are mostly interested in matters where they have an influence. So maybe it would be an idea to make the, the, the rulers of Europe depending on the populations rather than on the minorities that appointed them because that would make the, the logical uh, line of interest between the population, the consumer of media, and the, 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 the decision makers in, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. So I would definitely point the entire error uh, if there is a problem. I mean, personally, I don't have any problem communicating EU. I think EU plays a huge role in, in, in national media. I don't see this, uh, the, the, the greatest reason for complaints. But if there is a problem, it's definitely in the institutions here in Brussels that have not at all adapted to the modern world, uh, to, the, to the natural demand for, for uh, journalists and for media working, because we, of course, urge that there must be some connectivity between uh, those who take the decisions who are in power and th those people who empower them. Here, I mean, it, it would send shockwaves through the institutions here if you ever su suggest something to be on a referendum or the population to have a, a say in any matter. So this entire institution is built in despite of the population. Those who we now complain not read about the, the greatness of these institutions. I mean, isn't that ironic? So um, if there is a, a mistake here, it's, it's the treaties and they, it's not the media, it's not the audience who, who buy the, 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 um, the news, newspapers. They are actually quite sane. It's this entire house which is insane. Thank you very much, Mr. Messerschmidt. I will uh, now um, ask Mr. Marco Inserti, Head of Communication Center for European Policy Studies. Maybe you have a reaction to what's been heard? Uh, yeah, a few. I mean, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I'm actually one of the users of Euronet and one of those who actually listens to radio, uh, RTBF to be precise. Um, a negative remark to begin with, I find it a bit peculiar that with a few notable exceptions, we are here discussing the crisis of European journalism with very few journalists actually in the room. I think uh, many of the correspondents here would have had something to say about the, the remarks of some of the speakers. And of course, the timing is not good and all of that, but say. Um, just to preempt also my other points, uh, I more or less agree with many of the things that have been said. Uh, one of my concerns, in fact, is that I've heard these points made over and over again. I mean, they've been made at least for the last five years, some of them, and uh, it's a bit worrying that nothing is being done or nothing seems to be uh, done. I mean, not changing the European Parliament or rewriting the treaties, but there are some more modest changes. Uh, for example, I've, you know, Carol Bartak's point about the uh, live or the advantage of physically being present in the room. I've heard uh, the uh, International Press Association here asking for uh, press releases to be issued a bit later than the midday briefing, 
just to give time to the journalists to actually go back to their offices, at least to start typing at the same time as all of the others. Uh, that has not happened as far as I know. And there are several examples. Um, my other, I mean, the other big debate that seems to have been taking place here is whether um, there can or cannot be a, a European debate, a European public sphere. I mean, there I agree that the, the, the problem is more radical. It goes to the root of how the EU is organized. Having said that, I think, at least from my point of view, that uh, at one point we should really start trying to have uh, a proper European debate, because otherwise the problem is not just with the media, not just with the fact that uh, editors back in the capitals don't allocate enough space to the stories. It's also that the national audiences will still perceive the European Union of 27 member states as a Franco-led European Union, as a German-led European Union, and then you end up having uh, people wanting to renegotiate treaties just because they, they will be elected and they think that they can get their way, uh, which is not exactly constructive. Thank you very much, Marco. Mr. Yeah, Marco Inserti, actually we have uh, more journalists here than uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, I said with a few notable exceptions. But <laughs> yeah, at this point maybe I invite some of the internet journalists to uh, share a comment. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Florian Orban here, but at this moment I'm not seeing him. Do or uh, Mr. Dominique from RTBF, maybe a comment? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Inserti invited all the invisible journalists who are actually here maybe to share a comment on what's been said so far. Because he was missing, he was missing uh, the, uh, the part from the journalist side. And he wasn't aware of the presence of the journalists at this point. D uh -huh. D okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Do we have just pick that up though? You, we do have some other correspondence here in terms of the reactions to the difficulties of reporting here. Has anything actually got any better? Has it become easier at all to tell the story, or actually harder? Can we have some some thoughts, ideas, suggestions? Maybe then, sorry, just yeah. because I don't want to be seen as though I'm the, I had also the positive point, that's why I was calling for journalists here. Um, there has been a point made about the seniority of journalists here, uh, and I think that is uh, not necessarily the right question. Uh, I think I know a lot of young journalists here who strive to do their job to the highest standards, who are really idealistic about their job, who try to actually live up to the image that one has of the uh, investigative journalists and so on and so forth. The problem that I see and that I've heard made also by the Finnish colleague there, um, there's not enough time. There's so much to cover and so little time and they have to run from meeting to meeting because they, uh, most of the times there will be just one correspondent having to cover you know, anything from CAP to MIFID, EMIR, uh, and they have to be experts about everything. That affects the depth of you know, the journalism that you find here. That affects, I mean, I work for a think tank, so we see that uh, it's quite difficult to actually uh, manage to get journalists to come over to our place to take part in debates, also just as a background uh, briefing or a background information to get them to participate in topics which are not in, on the immediate radar. And that also has an impact because, of course, if you say, look, uh, economic imbalances or macroeconomic imbalances will be the next best thing, it is a problem if they say, well, you know, this time we're actually focusing on the services directive. And, and when the crisis comes, it's as if it has happened all out of blue. Great. Thank you, Marco. Oh, good. Please introduce yourself and give us some thoughts. Okay. My name is Moritz Kempel. I'm the local assistant um, to Mrs. Gephardt. And I wanted to say I totally agree with you because the, the editor-in-chief of the regional newspaper who said he can't see the regional point also said, asked me to write an article for his newspaper. No? He had nobody to send to this meeting. No? They have a totally lack of resources. Often they have nobody who can write an article for them, so I had to do it. I think that's a, one of the biggest problems, especially also in, in regional journalism, when politicians write the articles themselves. 
which doesn't always make That's for good reading. That's all I have to say. <laughs> it was good for me, but I don't think that it's good for newspapers and for journalism. Just one comment here yeah, Jan as well. Simmers. Yes, I'm from Denmark. Um, we speak a lot about news as only oriented towards uh, the institution, uh, but EU and Europe as such is much more than that. You can either tell the story about uh, so, so much decrease in percentage in Greece, cut downs and all that, or you can tell the stories about homeless people now, about how it really is, and that makes it a lot more interesting than this technocratic news. So I think actually part of the problem is that we journalists have a lack of imagination more than anything else. We just go the way we always do. We tell the story like we always do because we are lack of time, whatever. But we need a bit more imagination to uh, give it a face, like somebody said in there. We need it to have a face on the cutdowns. We need to have faces on the laws being passed. And that can be very regional, can even be very local, because the, the laws affect even in the local area. But it's also about EU institutions to make that clear. So if the European Commission is talking loftily about the 2020 strategy for economic growth, well, if you break that down, yes, that does actually mean youth unemployment, jobs, homelessness, etc., etc. But it's also, isn't it, and I would perhaps extend this to Fernando Carbato, you're here from the Communications Department of the European Parliament. It's your job, isn't it, among others, to try and make this news relevant, to, make, to break it down into something that is actually of interest to people in their homes, listening to radio or watching television. And I want to be very positive because I think that we are, in a way, too negative. I think that the, the things are dramatically changing in the last few years. At the, uh, you know, I'm responsible for the audiovisual unit in this house. And I, I can show you and I can give you the figures about how the media are using nowadays uh, the images and the, you know, all the contents from the European Parliament. And it's dramatically changed. We have at the Parliament first controversy, different point of view, as you just uh, could see now, with the different members intervening in a debate. And this is, you know, that's something that needs to be uh, underlined, because there is not this crisis anymore. And I think that the Europe as a whole, someone was mentioning just now, that Europe is not just a debate about one single uh, thing. Europe is becoming more than we realize a European debate or a European topic. For example, these days, could some of us say that Europe is not having a very important role, for example, in the presidential elections in France? Europe is not uh, having a very strong role in Hungary? These days, with the debate, uh, with the you know, confrontation with the, with the Commission, Europe is not playing a very important role in the Netherlands with this website, for example. We are not uh, really having already there some European topics that uh, we are still considering. They were not European. This is Europe. This is all about Europe. And the European Parliament, in this sense, when we have all these debates, for example, last week, we have the plenary in Strasbourg. It was not, I will say, the most interesting week, but still, we have more than 91 TV stations using our images. We have 30 uh, programs made in Strasbourg with different TV stations from BBC to NOS to SBT. Everyone was there working and trying to inform about Europe. Then there is something that is changing more than we realize, and I think it's Europe nowadays is uh, becoming a part, you know, of the debate. And the, you know, I'm a Spaniard, and then in Spain, of course, the crisis, the Greek questions, all the economics is on the uh, headlines of the newspapers on on TVs. That's why I think we need to change a bit this, you know, uh, recurrent uh, views on Brussels as it was boring. This is not boring anymore. The content and the interest and the tragedy in a way is there. Thank you very much. I would like to call uh, three more journalists to share their comments. So we have three more journalists here. One of them is Mr. Marek Walkuski. He's correspondent of the Polish radio in Washington. And I would like to ask you to briefly comment on the rules and interests of journalists who in Washington. Uh, thank you very much. Marek, okay. uh, Hello. I've noticed some demand uh, for positive news, and I have a positive news for you. 
I think the Brussels press corps is not going to disappear. And uh, the situation of uh, journalists in Brussels uh, is pretty good comparing to what's happening in the United States. I want to point to a huge change that's uh, happened in the United States uh, in the uh, last decade or two, uh, which is uh, a big change in the composition of Washington Press Corps. Uh, journalists from uh, U.S. states, mainly newspapers, have left Washington. In 1985, uh, over 600 uh, newspapers from American states had uh, offices in Washington. Now it's less than 300. Over 40% uh, uh, of journalists from American journalists from U.S. states left Washington entirely. Uh, other groups of journalists uh, have taken uh, their place. Uh, these are specialized media, foreign correspondents, but uh, American journalists left. I looked at Europe and I found out, uh, to my surprise, that there's no such a crisis uh, in Brussels. The number of uh, foreign journalists in uh, Brussels remains steady. Uh, it's about eight, nine hundred. Uh, I've heard about reports that uh, it's a free fall uh, of foreign media in Brussels. These re reports were untrue uh, because uh, they compared uh, the number of journalists, uh, foreign journalists based in Brussels uh, with previously reported number of journalists, technical staff, cameramen, sound recordists, as well as journalists from uh, Belgium. So the number uh, in Brussels is steady. And uh, I asked myself, what is the reason? What is the reason why uh, journalists uh, from EU states, uh, countries, stay in Brussels? And I think it's a national perspective. In the United States, you could, uh, the uh, newspapers could replace their correspondence with uh, articles just bought from m large media organizations like New York Times or, or McClatchy newspapers. It was, it's much cheaper. So they closed their offices in Washington. Uh, in Europe, such replacement is impossible because those differences, national perspective, cultural differences. You cannot just translate an article that was published in Le Figaro, translate it in Polish, and publish it in uh, Gazeta Wyborcza. It wouldn't be under understood. It w would not be interesting for, for Poles. You need national perspective. So you need a journalist from Poland who writes for Poles. Uh, maybe I could talk a little bit more later on uh, another phenomenon uh, in Washington, which is a positive trend. Uh, huge growth uh, in the presence of foreign media in Washington. In uh, 30, 40 years ago, there was about two, 300 foreign journalists in Washington. Now it's 1,800, which is much more in, than in Brussels, but it's a different topic, so may, if we have time uh, later, I can speak on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Walkuski. Uh, Vanessa, who is our next journalist? We have another journalist here? Yes, no, no. <laughs> next journalist. Yes, this will be uh, a lady, Mrs. Brigitte Alfta. She is director of the European Journalism Fund. She's sitting over here. Yes. Um, this could works. You briefly Yes, react to what's been said. We've had an American angle there, and now we are coming back to Europe again. Back to Europe, yeah, let's focus on Europe. I would like, in this context, to, to emphasize that being a journalist myself and having covered Europe for, for many years, I think we should make a clear distinction between media, and media possibly being in crisis, and journalists, and journalism, on the other hand. So I'll leave the media side to a side and focus only on journalism. Um, what I s journalism Fund is, a, is an organization where we fundraise to give money to journalists who want to do actually cross-border journalism, who want to work across borders uh, by pooling research power. Because many of the European stories, journalistic stories, um, 
have a, that would be added value when we pool research power. So one example is I get very good hard credible data in Denmark. I don't know, this was the story that we did was about medicine and health. I know nothing much about health, but I get good data and I know this is credible data. So I find another journalist in another country who is an expert on health. And so we pool our competences and we pool the access to the information that we can get. And at the same time we deal with European affairs so we can address several target groups. This is what I call cross-border journalism, so that we pool competences and knowledges and that we address each our audience in a language that we understand. So in that, sense, in that situation we are not competitors, but we can actually supplement each other and pool competences to make better research. I see a lot of examples of journalists trying to work in this way across borders and trying to fight to get money to do this kind of uh, research together. It does require a little bit extra money because you need to travel. Sometimes you need to translate. Sometimes you need to get access to certain databases that compare data across borders and so on. So my focus is to try to grab the, the enthusiasm and to, among the journalists that, who I meet and try to support them to use this enthusiasm to do European stories, which they actually then do to, uh, with, with great success. Thank you very much. I, I think we'll just go to yeah, NAP. All right, thank you very, very much. I'd just like to turn to one of the, now, where is she? Maritje Schake. Is you here? She just she left? She just left. Oh, no, with us, we're a bit, we're, oh, well, never mind. We're a little bit too um, off time. Um, oh, she's going to come back. Okay. Any reactions on anything that you've heard just now? Thank you. Over there. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Willy Rutten. I'm the director of the European Journalism Centre. I just want to comment on what Brigitte Afte and Franz said about money necessary for doing investigative reporting. There is a white paper out on, on, on your Europa website about the cost of the Euronews. And I suggest everybody take a look at it because the costs there are just incredibly ridiculous. They are triple pricing from what any TV station uh, today does. It's pricing from the mid-80s. And it is very embarrassing because there's a lot of money being spent on television and that money could go a long way for supporting radio or print journalists uh, uh, that, that, that could do a lot of more substantial work on this. And I think also what Brigitte just said that we have to make a difference here between media and journalism. Media is going for attention. Media is going for the scandal. Media is basically Paris Hilton in the parliament. That is what, what media does for you. And this is not what you want to go for. I think it is, it's a serious people who have an interest in, in really covering issues that are relevant that, that should be supported and this is something journalists do and journalists are quite struggling they're struggling in between you guys here in the parliament in the commission in institutions on one side and also they're struggling in, in with their bosses at home in their newspapers because they want to make a profit so I think especially the role of public broadcasting has to be strengthened because public broadcasting does not have to support this attention economy does not have to support Paris Hilton uh, kind of, of story reporting and I think as long as we mix these two, uh, we are in trouble. And, and also maybe one more remark about uh, young journalists and, and senior journalists. Uh, I'd rather go for young journalists because they're more independent of the people they cover. You see, with a lot of uh, people my generation, that they're very close to politicians. So why should I rock the boat with my politician? I'm quite nice. I'm accommodating. Whereas the younger people have no such, they're not sitting in the same boat and they will never sit in the same boat. So they can report more independently. Thank you. Thank you. I would just add to that point, um, that there is an issue, I think, here in Brussels we haven't yet talked about, well, somebody at the start talked about it, which is not just a seniority of correspondence, but also the hierarchy between the media. I think a lot of the union institutions and the individual commissioners, they will favour, for instance, the big media, the big national newspapers, the big national broadcasters, and it would not even occur to them to, in a closed-door briefing, uh, invite somebody who's perhaps from a local radio station and a local uh, newspaper. It will just be uh, the really big media names, and I think that is something that um, Brussels has to address, if I can just add that, even though I'm a host and I'm not supposed to be adding comments. Um, could I please just ask for other feedback from students, anything that you've heard, anything that you don't agree with? Thank you. Hello. Mm, um, 
Juuso, I'm also from Finland, from Tampere, and about the media and journalism and about the uh, uh, talk about radio's future. I think about uh, radio is about media. Radio's media, yes, it's true that millions of people is listening to radio, but what they actually are listening is music. It's news about per Paris Hilton in <laughs> Conference and it's uh, are they actually interested about mm, real stories about journalism? I don't think radio is the place for the EU journalism and the real stories. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's not uh, because it's not easy to concentrate when you listen to radio. Radio is place for entertainment. Radio is place for music. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, calling Mr. Wojciech Markiewicz, a journalist from the Polish radio. Maybe a comment on crossing borders in the meaning of uh, crossing forms there. Thank you very much. Um, let's say, who am I? I'm a member of Polish radio group. My president is in front of me, so I can be, I can be a good example how to uh, how to. Mm, support the two, uh, two kinds of radio, I mean public radio, traditional radio, and radio, as we used to call it, radio online. Uh, exactly, I work in a documentary and feature studio, and it means over 30 years. And it means that uh, we can, we are allowed to, to um, do the specific way to presenting things and facing the, all of those changes we have now, nowadays in radio and media. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, um, facing those problems, uh, we should keep in mind that um, we are serious not for the future of the news we should afraid but also for the practice of democracy uh, let's say it in different way uh, the radio shows how uh, uh, democratic the society is uh, now came to me the quotation Elias Canetti said somewhere that uh, you different uh, in different language, you think in different way. Here in the European Union, we confront the different ways of thinking. That's the first point. Uh, I agree with that uh, problem. It was uh, already mentioned here that the radio is a matter of language. I don't agree with my colleague from Finland that radio is only music. Uh, let's say radio is uh, music, but that this uh, ideas music. So you uh, really can listen to uh, sound of the soul. And it's very important that we say those things in the European Parliament because, uh, I mean, uh, um, when we uh, discuss how, uh, how uh, reform that uh, journalists, because we have no facts, we have here European, European Union, new context. I mean, it's, uh, we have problem like journalists to look for our lost identity. That's a ph rather philosophical problem. Because uh, when, uh, and let's, it's the, the last uh, remark I would like to say, how to do it. So when we look how people in ancient history did it, I can te tell it to you. So, um, when they, uh, the construction of new reality can be based on the example, founding a focal point in the ancient uh, times, such as city, country, let's say, union or union of countries. We are in that point now. The approach can be seen as symbolic geography, let's say. Uh, if we look for it, they mention around that point, I mean we are now, 
and they called it Agar Publicus. Uh, what does it mean? It means circular space which was free of local conflicts and uh, ano, uh, animosities or everyday bustle. Another circle, it's as short as possible. It was Agar Peregrinus, and, and we can watch it, Agar Peregrinus, through which and where uh, walking trays ran leading the neighborhood areas. The uh, uh, other, other circle, Agar Hosticus, the area of foreign and hostile enemies and conflicts. I mean, building the new reality means respect all those circles in the symbolic way of thinking, because the radio is a symbolic way that that's we used to say that it's a sound of the soul, and we, if we want to save the soul, even we don't have a head, because we are looking for the head, heads are changing. So uh, I'd like to tell you about Nike of uh, I'm Sam going Trace. I'm going to cut you off, I'm so uh, sorry. Evan, I'm Nike doesn't very, have very a head, briefly. but she has a soul, and that's it, what Thank I want to so say. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry to have to cut short it's your really, uh, bigger really white metaphysical ends. points. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually, though, because we have mentioned, um, well, we talked obviously a lot about the future of journalism, and also, um, also there's been some discussion about how informed journalists should be uh, about Europe, about uh, also the future of their own careers and how they can best use their profession to kind of spread the message about what goes on here. And for that, I'd like to turn to uh, Jose Manuel Perez Tornero. Are you here? You are there. Okay. Welcome from the University of Barcelona. You're the director of UAB. Um, I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about journalism training. Yes. That's right, isn't it? So give us some thoughts. And I will ask once again all our speakers, I'm sorry for being a bit tough, but just to be nice and to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry because I am late. <laughs> And I think it's a metaphor of Europe because it's not easy to, to go into the parliament. <laughs> we, just, we, was in, in an, we were in another door during uh, some minutes. Then this is, is uh, like a labyrinth, Europe. And then I, uh, I, will, I will say some words. Why media is only uh, technology? Why media is only music or a language? Why, why media is, is only an, institutional, an institution? I think there are now old and new media. And the radio is perhaps the pioneer of, of the new media because the, the, <clears throat> the way of production of the media, the new media, are very similar to the way uh, the people who work in the, in the radio work now. Then, <clears throat> Europe. What does, uh, Europe is ambiguous. It's an, an utopy, it's a place, a continent, a, a people, institution. But uh, Europe is interesting for the people. Yes, Champions League is very interesting. <laughs> the problem is Europe has no, con no content has no um, Europe, me, European media. We haven't European audience, but we need European media and Europe uh, uh, audience. I think the solution is the young people who will work by new media, by the convergence between radio, a smartphone, uh, etc., in another and the construction on another new public sphere. And we need more participation. It's not the old journalism we need now. I think it's well, to begin the discussion about that. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> very much. Uh, we have a comment from a lady here. Could you introduce yourself, um, please? Hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Victoria, and I work now as press officer for the group of the Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. But today I would like to speak as a frustrated journalist, because I was working as a journalist in Spain for 13 years for a magazine. I was covering EU issues, and I loved it. And I had the resources, and I could travel, and I could cover real stories of Europeans and how they were living Europe and the European project. 
But then the crisis started. I was lucky enough that I was one of the first victims of, of this journalism crisis, and I could find a job in the institutions. And I think that there is a big problem in, in Europe if young people and people who are really looking forward to being journalists, vocational journalists, at the end have to look for a career as civil servants. And, the, and I think that this is something also for, for the young people here and for the students to take into consideration. And I, I would also like to go, I mean, this is on a personal note, and, uh, but I would also like to, to go back to the title of, of this session because it's uh, European Journalism in Crisis. And I think that here you, we have to look at the two terms of this equation because there is one crisis that it's related to Europe and the European project and politicians not really knowing what they want to do with this European project at this point. And then there is a second crisis, and it's the crisis of journalism that is not related to, to Europe. It's a, it's a crisis of a model. It's a crisis that started, I mean, in every country. And I think that it's really dangerous. The crisis in journalism is very dangerous for democracy. And I think that in this House, in the European Parliament, it should be discussed from this point of view. Because if you don't have a quality, uh, good quality journalism, you won't have citizens who have the right information to make the political choices. And, and just to clarify, uh, media is not journalism. We're talking about radio, about the internet. These are the platforms. But journalism is the concept. It's the concept of looking for truth. It's the concept of fact-checking, and it's the concept of controlling all the powers, the political powers. And I have to say that, uh, in my opinion, one of the elements of the crisis of covering the EU is the excess of institutional communication. Communication is not journalism. And sometimes uh, these media companies think that they don't need a correspondent because we have so much information. But it's, that's not journalism. This is just like the raw material that journalists would have to digest and then pass it in the right way to the citizens. Thank you. Uh, we have a Polish member of the European Parliament, Mr. Jacek Sariusz Wolski. He made. Uh -huh, he's, uh, let's, they told let's, me that he is on his way. Well, let's do the other. So maybe we will move on to Mr. Janusz Adamowski, the Dean of the Faculty of Journalism and Political Sciences at Warsaw University. Could you follow up on that, please? Okay. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> So, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with some, mm, uh, some constatations. First of all, journalism as a profession is in a deep crisis. This is, this is out of question, in my opinion. Uh, but, and this is very interesting, in, at the same moment in Poland we had thousands of candidates for journalism or media departments, especially in good, well-known universities like Warsaw or Jagiellonian. Secondly, the media, as very important institutions of public interest, are in crisis, too. For improvement of their currently inconvenient position after scandals, like News of the World affair, they should attract new consumers by offering them a new, more interesting content, and at the same time, proving the role of fourth estate, not first, not second, but fourth estate. And finally, radio, even still popular among people, is also in crisis, especially as a result of new media growing popularity as well as a still leading position of television as the most popular medium in the world. So, these are main reasons why we should try to prepare new proposals aimed at the improvement of this, let me say, dangerous, very dangerous situation. And let me concentrate on the radio journalism. Radio should attract new listeners, listeners of a new generation, 
people accepting not only popular music and entertainment, but also, maybe first of all, quality information. For that reason, we are obliged to prepare a new generation of young journalists, very good educated, and looking at all difficult problems, not only from a national, but also from pan-European perspective. In other words, we should prepare new, very innovative, fresh program of journalist studies, including all the most important European values and the best educational experience of some good European schools of journalism. But of course, we should include in this work good quality media institutions, like the best European radio stations. The most effective way to prepare a good journalist is, in my opinion, a mixture of academic theory as well as a good practice in a leading European radio stations. If we organize this educational pan-European system under the umbrella of a distinguished European organization, like, for example, Euronet, I'm sure that we will gain a final success. So, finally, let me declare our participation in this interesting and important project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Adamowski. I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Jacek Sariusz-Wolski, the Polish member of the European Parliament. Uh, we've noticed that you've missed quite a lot, but you probably have a short comment prepared for us. Unfortunately, you will have to leave in about 15 minutes. Well, it's nice to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Nobody knows more how important journalists are than members of the European Parliament. Because to much higher degrees than functionaries, be it of uh, European level or national level, they, ha they, they are a bridge between the two worlds, between so-called Brussels and between the, the public opinion at home. Because the, by definition they are shuttling between the two. Uh, Saying that there is a democratic, de democratic deficit in the Union is a trivial thing on which uh, hundreds of volumes have been already uh, written and, and, and many things said. But I would complete this by saying that there is a communication gap. What we do witness uh, at home when we go back is that there is a public opinion which is uh, to a modest, insufficient degree aware of what is going on in European uh, politics, economics, and social life. What we do not know and what, is, uh, what we do know and what is not known on the national level is that Europe as a reality, I mean a key communautaire, all the policies and all the things which are being dealt already on the Europe fully or partly, that this reality is much more present than the perce perception of it. So th people in the national public opinions think that there is much less Europe than in the real world there is. Uh, they do not realize that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the legislation is not born in the national parliaments and capitals, is born in Brussels. How important are various policies? I don't want to go into detail. So there is a gap between reality and perception. And that uh, means that there is a huge role for the media because who, if not the media and the journalists are, 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 are well placed to fill this gap. Uh, politicians uh, try, but they are not uh, made for it. In the first, that they are not able to, as practice shows, to present complicated things in an understandable way. And second, they are busy with, like us here, in legislating rather than in uh, at explaining, uh, at explaining uh, the things. Uh, to, the, to the wider public. There's a problem of national media and European media. As you know, there are embryonic European level media in the form of some uh, journals, uh, newspapers, portals, and so forth, but they are just a very marginal, although very important, part of it. Uh, what do we need in order to cover this communication gap? Obviously, we do need good journalists. Journalists which are aware of their mission, 
uh, and journalists which are also prepared in terms of the professional profile. That means education about which the professor just spoke, uh, formal education, studies, whatever. In the best case, these studies should be done from the very beginning, not in the national format, but in a European format, which means plurinational professors and plurinational students working together. That means training on the specific topics or in the short forms of training. That means practice because you cannot learn European journalism from the books or from the lectures only. You have to, to practice. Uh, and then, as we often hear from journalists, we European parliamentarians, uh, it is not only their work which counts. It's very important what is the editorial policy of relevant TV stations, radio stations, and uh, newspapers, and more and more uh, virtual forms of communication like various portals, uh, social media, and so forth. So edi ed editors at home, which are even further away in terms of perception of what is important for you for, for European, from a European perspective. So the short uh, insight into the situation shows us that what we do read in national newspapers, see on national TV screens and in radios, <coughs> is not complete because the European side of everyday life of every European citizen is not covered as it should be and there is over-proportional representation of the national level uh, problematic and under-representation of the European level problematic. There is a resistance of the classical existing uh, media coverage. Uh, it is also linked to the fact that the sources of income for the media come from publicity on the national level, not on a European one. So there has to be some kind of uh, engineered change uh, of the situation through changing the profile of journalists, through having uh, really aware of the magnitude of the problem, journalists themselves and their organizations, to co-opt uh, uh, academic world to do the, to, to, to do the job, uh, and, and then to, to also to, to, to co-opt and, and to try to influence the editorial uh, part of it. And last but not least, uh, financing. Uh, European journalism is uh, structurally underfinanced. National media do not spend as they should enough money. Journalists working on European topics are underpaid. Their professor, professional status is not stable enough to secure the independent journalism as it should be. Uh, they are not helped by those who should help them. So there is a need for a program to support this category of, uh, of journalism, which we call European journalism. And although it is much more difficult and far-reaching uh, target, is to create European-level media like Euronews, like uh, European Voice, like uh, New Europe, I don't mention, and portals like EU Observer, Euroactive, and so forth, which you, which you all know. Uh, in order to have to bring closer the two levels of journalism uh, in the national capitals and in, 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 in Brussels uh, uh, itself. Thank you. Do you think, thank you very much, thank you. Can I just have one? Yeah. Thank you. Just, you said uh, there should be, should engineer some changes. Do you think that perhaps then uh, there should be a heavier hand then in terms of influencing the output for national broadcasters. So, for instance, should uh, the perhaps leading uh, evening show on a, a national broadcaster have to have, for instance, at least two or three minutes of their schedule devoted to EU news? Would that be the answer, do you think? I hesitate because uh, once... once uh as Europe Minister in my country, we try to build special EU topic related programs and to support them. But being given that at that stage the problematic of what Europe does uh, is so pre present in, in every sphere of life, creating a ghetto type information is no longer a solution. The problems which Europe faces and which Europe solves, or which Europe is unable to solve, 
should be present in all possible forms of journalism rather than special programs on that. Although I don't deny, I do not deny the need for some topical, topical uh, issues. But when I say that there, there is a need of engineering, I mean uh, putting uh, financial and organizational effort to this end. There should be journalistic Erasmus. There should be College of European Journalism. There should be a program financed by the Union of exchange and of stagiaires between the uh, relevant uh, reductions. Um, and so far, one can, I mean, th there should be finance. We have the same problem. We need European diplomacy. What do we do? We create European diplomats. We need European journalism, so we should create European journalists. And for that reason, you have to have a, a program, a budgetary line, institutional backup. Sorry? Sufficient? Okay. So I, I, I think that, I mean, being given, I mean, uh, uh, looking at the results, uh, it doesn't uh, fulfill if it is the, 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 the task uh, itself to a sufficient degree. Uh, so an, an increased effort is needed. And if we, if we look on the situation today when there is a, an overwhelming uh, crisis uh, confronted with the needs to, Europe, to have a European action to counter this, this crisis, and at the same time there is public opinion in member states who totally ignores the necessity of joint action, uh, which paralyzes the union and brings this union at the verge of collapse, uh, that's the, how serious the problem is. Uh, to communicate the European issues in a professional and attractive, in an attractive way. And from that point of view, Europe does not do sufficiently uh, much and, and, and sufficiently well what it should be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You had a point. We're going to wait just one second before you make it, because I have to say, and okay, one, just one more student comment here. Thank you very much. Finland, I think it's over there. Sorry to disturb again. Um, I just have to continue because it's going in my mind. Uh, users' uh, comments about the radio's purpose. I disagree, like many other people disagree, that radio would be only because to listen to music. I'm a radio journalist, I'm a speaker there, and I also do the news. So even that you won't do the news and put uh, EU uh, news to there, I can choose which topic I will speak on the radio. And of course, if you are listening to radio and you want to hear Britney Spears, unfortunately, I will say something clever between the songs if I found out that you have done really good decisions in you, a baronet. And that uh, interests me. I can choose what I will speak. Okay, the audience may not like it, and then I notice that, and I will change the topic next day. So the radio workers, they also have this great opportunity to take the news to the radio. And there are many research which shows that uh, radio is maybe, if not the best or the biggest, but maybe similar with TV um, channel where the people get the news. Like, I don't watch TV news. I always listen to radio and the news from there. So it's much more than just listening to the music. Sorry, we can discuss this about later, user. <laughs> Thank you very much. At this point, I would like to thank Vanessa Mock for doing a thank great job. Much. Unfortunately, she has to leave us. She has other things to do, which are important as well. Thank Reporting. you very much. Okay. And at this point, we are actually...